the dirt ground in the very beginning and he breathed life into it. And part of maturing and growing in God is going back to that dust state. And so for me, the whole process of development in the prophetic has been a laying down of my life and picking up what God says about me. And so that's what God wants to do for all of our lives, whatever the call of God is on your life, is that we decrease and he increases. So that's been kind of my journey and my process. And one of the things that I picked up on that Bob was saying this morning is God's doing a new thing. Wasn't that in that song that we were singing, that we sang last night, we sang this morning? God is doing a new thing. And if he's doing a new thing, he needs a young people in the earth that perceive it and know God's doing something new. So I need to get ready for some new things. That means it's not going to be the way it's always been before. That's what happened to the disciples when Jesus showed up. God showed up to do a new thing. He'd never done that. They'd been sacrificing animals on altars, and God showed up and said, in this moment, in this time, in the line of history, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to send my son here. And there had to be some people who went, it's him, because there were people who didn't. That's the call on your life is for you to go, God is here in the earth doing something he's not done before, and I want to be a part of that. So moving on. So I have here the prophetic dimension, hearing the voice of God. So today, tomorrow, we're going to talk about what does the Bible say about prophets. We're going to look at scriptures, and all that's coming tomorrow. Today, I want to talk to you about the prophetic dimension because a prophet, they're not a prophet if they don't distribute it to you. Do you know what to distribute means? give it to you. If, if somebody's distributing water bottles, they're giving a water bottle to everybody. So a, a true prophetic dimension is going to give you the prophetic. And what I mean, do I say I want y'all, you guys should all be prophesying? Not at all. To be prophetic is to hear God's voice. And that's what we hope is over this week at Art Life, you're going to just like a hunger to hear the voice of God rise up, a new ability to hear the voice of God, to be able to discern the voice of God, that's what we're looking for, and that's what we're expecting. That's what we believe God has told us he's going to do for you. And now let's see if I can, technology is not my thing, so we'll see if I make the PowerPoint go the right direction. What does it mean to be prophetic? Let's just start at the beginning of that. So God's design, he had an original design when he, dis- when he thought of creating man. In Genesis 1, 27, 28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. God blessed them and, say that next part with me, said to them. What's the first thing God did? The very first thing God did was talk to man. Be fruitful and multiply and subdue, have dominion over fish, and he gives them all kinds of of charge and what they're going to do in the earth. The very, very, very first thing God did was talk to man. That's the original design of God. And if you read Genesis, you'll see Adam is walking and talking with God every day. That's the design of God for your life and my life. So man sins, and he gets kicked out of the garden, and there's separation between God. But Jesus came back to restore to us the original design of how it was always supposed to be. So the Bible doesn't say that Adam was a prophet, but he was the most prophetic human ever because he walked and he talked with God every day. In John 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This word hear here is the word shama, and it means hear and obey. It's just one word. So it's basically saying, My sheep hear and obey my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So I, under, I bolded sheep because it's very important to understand that to be a sheep I have to have a shepherd, okay? That's step one. So if you have not come to know the great shepherd, Jesus, as we're, as we're listening to Bob and as we were worshiping last night, if nobody's ever told you that Jesus came and died for you to save your life because he had a plan marked out before the foundations of the earth, I want to be sure to be one of the people to tell you that God's design is to make you a sheep, to make you one of his own because he loves you so much. You may have been brought to art life so you could come to know him as your Lord and your Savior, as your Father, as your Comforter, as your guide in life. And so if that's true for you and you're hearing all this and you're going, I don't understand part of what's being said, I really want to encourage you to grab Larry and I after this session or grab uh, Miss Teresa 
or grab Jason and let us know that you would like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You want to become a sheep. You want to come into the kingdom of God because we would, it would just be tragic for you to be here at Art Life all week and go home and not actually intimately know God for yourself. That's our deepest passion. So, But it, when you are a sheep, and some of you have known God for a bazillion years because now you're like seniors in high school and early in college, and so it seems like that's been forever for you. And it's your right and your inheritance it's how you're supposed to be is hearing the voice of God. And I don't mean just hearing fuzzy. I mean crystal clear clarity of God speaking to you. That's the design God has for your life. Now I'm hearing back to this clicker thing. To become prophetic is to become a person who hears God's voice and understands his intent and then obeys him. So it's not actually hearing if I don't actually obey. What's the point of hearing if you're not going to obey? So if God knows your heart and you're asking him questions and he doesn't seem to be answering you, you might want to check your heart real quick and go, well, if he gives me the answer I don't want, am I really going to follow him and obey him? So I might need to deal with my heart first and go, God, I want whatever you want because you're such an amazing God. All right? So we want to, when we think about being prophetic, we want to think about being people who hear and obey God. That way he can lead us to go and do whatever he wants. And what, think about a group of young people like you who are all listening to God and doing what he says. That's a powerful group of young people. What's that a picture of? A maze. A little mouse in that maze. Another maze. A little race car in that one. So I want you to get that picture in your mind of a maze. The voice of God is our navigation system. So life is like a maze. I mean, think about all the choices you make every day and all the decisions you have to make. And in the middle of a day, a decision to get angry or to forgive or not forgive or to um, sometimes there are major decisions like universities I'm going to choose or career paths or classes I'm going to take or a boyfriend or girlfriend, is that the right person for me? And some, some are big and some are small. All of them matter. They all accumulate to a life. And the voice of God is designed for believers, for Christians who know him and live in his kingdom to be navigated so that we land exactly where he designed us to land, which is our best selves in our best life. So life is like a maze, and God's voice guides us. And what better to have a guide than someone who knows the end from the beginning? In that little maze, there's an out somewhere. Um, my, one of my granddaughters loves to do mazes on the paper, all those little paper mazes. And you always have an entrance, you're trying to get out that, exact, that one's point. And that's how God is. He has a point for you. He, your life has a design. He's a master architect and builder with a blueprint that before the foundations of the earth, he had you in his mind and he had a blueprint. When You know when architects get ready to build a building and they have those great big old plans of where the walls are going to go and where the doors are going to go? There's one of those for your life. And if we will log on, you know how you get on your computer and you log on, logging on to the other realm where God is, and we allow him to guide us, then we will make our way through where he wants to take us. I keep setting this thing down. And our greatest example is Jesus. Because he was just a man like you. Remember, he laid down his godness and he came here as a man but if you read the New Testament, you'll, hear, you'll see all the times that he slips away to go be alone with the Lord. Or how in the world did he know when he went to the pool of Bethesda to heal one man? Wouldn't your human compassion overtake you, and you if you had the ability to heal everyone at the pool? I always look at that and I think, how did he not heal them all? He didn't heal them all because he was logged on and the father said, that one. And so he healed that one. Because he tells us in John 4.34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And in John 5.19, Jesus says, I can do nothing by myself. Can you, have you read that? Jesus says, I can do nothing by myself. Isn't that crazy? I only do what I see the Father doing. So when we talk about growing up, becoming our most mature self at whatever age you are, becoming like Christ, that means I want to become a person that I only do what my father's doing. I only say what the father's saying. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is if I'm hearing his voice. 
Does that make sense? So if we go back to obedience, there's a scripture that says, and I didn't write it down. Maybe one of you know, and you can holler it out to me. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So we all want intimacy with God. We want an intimate, loving relationship with our Father. And he told us one of the ways is, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So when we hear him and we obey him, we literally are declared with my, our life, I love you. I love you above me. I love you above my preferences. I love you most. And that's why obedience is such a powerful tool. And God always wants to tell you more. So when you hear something, don't go, okay, I got my answer. I'm off and running to go do my thing. Ask questions. Inquire. Listen. Talk to people that you respect and know love God. Talk to people that you know hear God correctly. Not weird, spooky, crazy stuff. People that actually hear God, you can look at their life, their life's getting built, they're growing in God, they're wise, they're mature, they have peace, they have joy. Follow those people. Have conversations with those kinds of people. Blank slide. Oh, no, there is. Noise. Noise. So if you picture yourself in a restaurant and you're trying to have a conversation with the people at your table and they have blaring loud noise going, or there's the baby in the table next to you screaming and crying and throwing stuff, and you're trying to lean in and hear what they're saying, but you're like struggling because it's like, I can't hear you over the, what's that word? I just occasionally want to hear your voices, so I know you're still here with me. Say noise. 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 So noise becomes a problem for hearing God. So there are enemies to becoming prophetic. We could be, what could be noise in your life? So what do you think could be noise that could stop you from being able to hear the voice of God? Right here? Music. And particularly if you're listening to the wrong kind of music that has words that are really corruptive to your spirit, that war against who God says you are. Busyness, that's an excellent one. We're just so busy, and God's like chasing us, trying to go, I really have something to tell you, and we're so busy. That's a great one. I hadn't thought of that. Who else? Selfishness. Selfishness is a big one. I think it pops up here in a little bit. Self-will, if the door is open, means God can get through to me. Being selfish, self-centered, self-willed, it shuts the door faster than anything else peers. And, and what can happen with peers is that if we're wanting to please people more than we're wanting to please God. Because what if God says go left and everybody's going right? Then all of a sudden it's, it becomes noise for me. So that's an excellent one. The world, just the culture and the values that are going. We live in a declining world, don't we? Things are kind of getting crazy out there and look like they're getting darker and darker. But in the kingdom of God, it's a bright and shining day. That's why I think it was you said last night, like arise and shine. That's what God is wanting for you guys. Is, and how you do it is by being able to hear God. So you know what he does, he gives you? Perspective. He opens your eyes to see things through the way he sees it, not how your news tells you or how the world's telling you what's going on. You start to see life the way God sees it which is accurate. Anybody else? What else you got? What else is noise? Shirley, one more. Take one more. One somebody. Greed. Right, which kind of goes in with selfishness as well, is wanting. Um, so let's see. can't remember what's on this line. So personal opinions and personal ways. Sometimes noise is our own self. I want what I want. My personal opinion. My personal way. So, fear of what other people will think more than what God thinks. We talked about that one. Your experiences. So, things that have happened in your life being more true than what God says. So, if you've been maybe abandoned, maybe you had a parent that just left, maybe you had a good friend that just left, maybe somebody died and it went into you as feeling abandoned, and God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But your life experience says, no, but people leave. You have, that becomes noise. You have to say, I choose to believe what God says more than what I've experienced in life. Okay? 
And this is the big one we talked about that we talked that y'all said, self-will, the biggest enemy of all, of all. I want what I want. Death to self-principle. So the death to self-principle is I decrease that he might increase. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, if you want to live in the real kingdom, if you want all the promises of the kingdom, if you want to be my disciple, then you must deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow me. And with that, it's like, and then I'll make a journey with you. And we'll go on a process and journey together, and I'll take you beyond your wildest expectations. But you have to be willing to deny yourself first. That's actually, you know, if you put a seed in the ground, it has to die. And then out comes life. What's that a picture of? A hurricane. What's right in the middle? The eye. So they say, I don't know, I'm not a meteorologist, but all of these winds out here can get like 100 miles per hour. We had a hurricane sit over our house one time, 80 mile an hour winds for like four hours, I think, because we used to live in Houston. Um, But in the eye, it's completely still. So planes will fly in to measure the wind, and they can get to the center, and it's completely still in there. And that we call stilling the noise. So sometimes in life when we need to hear the voice of God and we have all these other things creating noise, we have to get still. And we have to ask God to help us still the noise. I want to be, sit in that place, in that eye of the hurricane. Everything in life is swirling around me. But I want to be still in here so that God can speak to me. So we have to still the noise. What does that say? God is a builder. So a lot of times when people think about the prophetic, and when, particularly when they start thinking about a prophet prophesying to them, they think about being blessed. Oh, I'm going to get so blessed. Or you think about somebody praying over you. Think about a pastor. Oh, he's going to bless us. But what I want you to understand is that God is a builder, and he puts leaders in the, inside the kingdom of God to build your life because they're like him. And he's a builder. He promised, I will build my church. And that's part of why you're here at Art Life, is you are the clay, which again was originally dust. And they take all that, whatever it is, and they add water to it. And they put it on the potter's wheel. And there's a molding that begins to take place. And this is you, and this is God. And right now, in the spirit realm, that's what it looks like. He is shaping you and molding you. God shapes us into what seems appropriate to him and to his need. So God has a need. We don't think of God as being needy, do we? We think of people as being needy. But God actually has a need. He had a need for Paul when he was first Saul, and he blinded him on the road to Damascus. He had a need for him to wake up and see himself the way God said he was. He thought he was doing right for for God and he was killing Christians because he thought they were misrepresenting the kingdom of God. And then Paul had to make a choice when he got blinded and he went to Ananias' house. He had to decide, am I going to be who God says that I am or I'm going to stay who I was before? God had a need for Paul to be because that's how we have most of the New Testament written. That's why we know so much about the early church and what's going on is that Paul said yes to being what God needed him to be. God needs something from you too. He has a design for you. So I put here trust God enough because sometimes that's the hard part is trusting God. When God first started coming to me and having me public speak years ago, I am like, this is not like my natural bent in life. I would like be the person on the back row Um, I used to get such bad stomach aches, sick to my stomach, all the stuff. And it was very hard for me to go against my personality, which was to, to not be seen, to not be the person in the front. But God needed me to do that. That's how he wanted his grace to land in me and come out. But because I grew up in kind of a messy family and an alcoholic dad and all kinds of stuff, my tendency was hide. <laughs> All the crazy people acted crazy, and I would hide in cabinets and go, you know, do, just avoid the, the noise and the mess. 
But then I get saved and I come to the kingdom of God and God's like, no, but see, I had a design before any of that for you. And so he put me on the potter's wheel and he had to teach me and is still teaching me to trust him enough. So if you look in your Bible, you'll find a story about Noah, not Noah, Moses. <laughs> there are stories about Noah in there, but that's not the one I'm talking about. So Moses and Aaron, the people are griping and complaining because they need water. And they're in the wilderness, and they're trying to get to the promised land. And God tells them to go and speak to the rock. And God will make water gush out of it. Only when they're frustrated, because the people are whining and complaining again. You can imagine if you're the leader. And they get to the rock, and instead of speaking to the rock, does anybody know what Moses did? He strikes it. Not once. How many times does he strike it? Twice. So the first time, maybe you just got frustrated. Second time, you intentionally struck that rock. And, and God was faithful. Water gushed out and people got drink. But Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. And he died. And the Bible says he didn't trust God enough. And it cost him getting to go where he traveled all the way from Egypt to get there. And he didn't get to go all the way in. We want to trust God enough. God is such a good father and he's so faithful. You can trust him. You can follow him all the way to the end of your life. So I have some pictures of pottery here. So there's that, that size and shape of a piece of pottery. What do you notice about that one? Smaller. What about this one? A lot bigger. How about this one? Yeah, it's more like a vase or a pitcher or something like that. So when we look at these images, and I want you to think about yourself, if he's the potter and he's got some clay and you're the clay, you, don't, you an issue, listen to his voice and you let him tell you, you don't know if you're supposed to be the little one or the big one or the pitcher or the one over there. And the thing is, there's not one better than the other. All have the same value. If I need a drink of water, I want the little one. I don't want the one this big to go try to get some water and drink it and I would splash it, it would spill all over me. So the most appropriate and accurate one would be the smaller one. But if I'm going to feed 100 people and I've made a big bowl of pasta, I want the big bowl to put all the pasta in to feed all the people. So I want you, what I want you to be hearing is that God's design for you, you may be, his design may be something very visible or it may be very behind the scenes and not seen. It, it doesn't matter. It's about being who God designed you to be because your function is what matters. He, he's designed you a certain way. He's allowed your life to go on a certain trajectory to meet a particular need. And it's the best for you. So we want to give God the okay. We want to give an internal yes on the inside of me that says, yes, I want to be whatever shape you need me to be. Does that make sense? Okay, raise your hands. And let's just pray real quick. Y'all pray this with me. Father, I want to be exactly who you have designed me to be. I trust you enough to build me, to change me, to help me want to want what you want. Amen. Just a, a quick point, the advantages of being the spouse. So, there's another kind of noise that this will show us, and that would be the noise of comparison, right? So you want to make sure that if this is how God designed you, you're not looking at the vase going, if only I could be a vase, right? Because then you can't hear God clearly, right? You have to understand that God's design for you is the best design, right? It is the best design. So looking across the way at other people, peers, people in school, and wishing you were that athletic or wishing you were that creative or wishing your voice was that way or whatever all those comparisons are, that begins to create noise inside of you, right? So one way you begin to silence the noise is telling God, I trust you enough. If you want me to be this bowl, I want to be this bowl. If you want me to be this small bowl, to hold maybe some precious things where you don't need the volume, then I'll be the small bowl, right?
excellent. Romans 8, 28. Let's read this together. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who have been called according to his purpose. Let's read it one more time. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who have been called according to his purpose. When God says this in Romans that he causes all, all means all. And so if we can begin to believe this is true, that the word of God is true, it changes how we view life. It changes the dark times in life, the really disappointing times in life, the times when things happen that you have no control over and you just have to go through it. If I really know that the word of God is true, then I know that this very thing that seems rotten, seems like I'd like to just bypass this part of my journey, but that God is going to work it for good somehow, because I'm called according to his purpose, because I'm his. He owns me. And because he owns me, if he's allowing my life to go through a certain part of the journey that's not the part I really would prefer, but if I can remember and believe that he's sovereign and he's designing my life and that he designed this path through a valley versus a mountaintop for a purpose, then I'll begin to look for the purpose. I'll be looking for the hand of God because I'm the clay on the wheel for him to shape things. Sometimes it isn't until you've been in a place where you needed compassion and you needed kindness that you learn to be kind and compassionate. And it's sometimes, like for us, we've had some really struggling times in our life. But in those lowest moments, when God came through and did things beyond our wildest expectations, we learned things about God. We would not have learned had we not gone through those deep valleys. When we found him faithful in that low place, that's when we found out he is a faithful God. It's not just a story in the Bible. He's been faithful to me. And so if you begin to believe all of the things in life are designed to build me and shape me a certain way, then I will not get resentful or fall into depression or anger or the lies of the enemy that says God's forsaken me. I mean, clearly... This is bad enough he's not here. But if I know he's always there and he's always using everything, then it shapes my mind and it shapes the way I grow and I develop. God builds us through his speaking to us. Hearing the voice of God produces. These are some things. I think it's tomorrow that we talk about all the different ways we hear the voice of God. But hearing the voice of God, these are things that can produce faith, sight. Let me tell you one of your biggest battles in life. One of your biggest battles in life is the battle for sight and blindness. And you should write that one on your paper so you can go think about what does she mean by that? That some of my biggest battle is for sight and blindness. God wants you to be sighted. He wants you to see. He doesn't want you to have blind spots. Hearing the voice of God produces an illumination of our path. He lights our path. Partnership with God. God wants to partner with you. He's not sitting way over here just sending edicts to you. Do this, don't do that, do this. That is not what God is like. He wants to partner with you. He wants to have conversations with you. He wants to stabilize you, strengthen you, push you forward. He wants to remove darkness, despair, blindness, discouragement. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you peace. All right, does anybody have a question? Any questions? Any comments? Any thoughts? In the mic. Oh, he's saying so everybody can hear the question. 